those games still hold up. But sh- but shouts out to Tony Hawk. Yeah, shout <laughs> <laughs> out Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. Yeah. Here we are again for another episode of the Scoped Exposure Podcast. I'm super pumped to be chatting with uh, a homie out in the BC area. Taylor, how are you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me. No, no problem. Um, And, you know, with this whole quarantine kind of time, um, obviously there's a little bit more flexibility that I'm providing for reaching out to people that you know, I don't yeah. get to do official FaceTime with on a day-to-day basis, but I know that we've chatted about doing this, you know, with a few wild rose roses. Uh, yeah. I was trying to remember the last time you asked me to do it. I actually totally forgot you asked me to do it, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, glad we're finally doing some. Yeah. So uh, for the, you know, nine people who are watching or listening, who don't know who you are, or what you do, could you give a little intro about yourself? Uh, so I'm Taylor. Um, I uh, started DPK Promotions in Vancouver. Uh, We've been doing hardcore shows there for the last six years. Uh, Playing guitar and juice and Worldview and then some other bands in the past. Yeah. 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 And, uh, (laughs) you know, like there's there's a lot to unpack with the DPK, um, I guess, like, you know, promotions collective as a whole um, yeah but you know i like to get a little bit of context about everyone as far as how they got into heavier music how they got into hardcore um so can you talk to me about you know some of those formative years of you know finding out um that style of music uh when you're growing up yeah um i mean i think for anyone my age they definitely can credit like tony hawk's pro skater and stuff like that <laughs> um true. i mean that for sure i mean skateboarding in general like, uh, I mean, that was the first time I heard, like, uh, Rage Against the Machine. I remember that being, like, um, the intro. It was the, that was the intro song to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. I remember that being, like, uh, you know, clicking. Um, and then I think I remember, like, going to a friend's house before I ever had PlayStation that had, like, this. They had, like, the free sample for Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. And I think that had, like, the Public Enemy Anthrax uh, okay. collab song. And that that was sick and then just like i mean growing up in the 90s like you know like grunge and like punk and metal and stuff like was not like popular but like it was on the radio like i had radio stations where i grew up that like played corn and stuff like that and like you know so like it was kind of like it was i felt like it was you know around all the time um but uh and then like getting older um i remember seeing like uh a music or no, it was uh, it was an ad for like Lincoln Park's new album, and we were like checking that out, and that was like one of the first metal CDs I bought when I was uh, ten, and that uh, you know stuck with me, you know, still. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I actually threw it on the other day just to like I haven't listened to it in years, and I was just like, oh man, it's still sick. Yeah, no, um, that's and, actually sorry to cut you off, but um, no, I think no. that's a you know a really good point. Is just you know contextually speaking, like yeah, this like the more aggressive music if you want to umbrella umbrella term it um was just more mainstream you know totally. in the like late 90s early 2000s and and now like a, a network like mtv would like wouldn't be caught dead playing like the new slutnot music video totally. or anything like and, that and like with that being said i mean i remember like again like you know seventh grade and stuff watching like being in a skateboarding like people bam was on wild boys and jackass were on um, I remember like watching Wild Boys and like uh, Victory Records had like ads for you know like Bar- Barrier Dead's new album and stuff and like not knowing this was hardcore but like thinking it was metal or whatever and like buying that that album and you know stuff along those lines. Uh, my older sister she she wasn't like into metal and stuff but like uh, people she hung out with like I remember she used to like be in like Senses Fail and stuff like that. Right. And her one of her classmates um i skated with her younger brother and we played football together and they showed me uh 
they're like, oh, you're into heavy music, you should check out uh, this band called uh, From Autumn to Ashes. Okay. And yeah. I, I just found, I, so they're like a Long Island kind of like metalcore, kind of a bit more on the emo side, like they had those the singing parts, but like had the heavier stuff too. Mm-hmm. So I remember like listening to that. Um, what else? Uh, but yeah, I mean, like just, you know, around that time. And then, you know, come high school, I really got into like Slipknot and stuff. Um, also backtracking, like, I mean, Metallica was on the radio and stuff like that, you know? So like high school, I was like really into metal. Then I got into like punk and stuff. Um, and then, uh, you know, like I had like this punk compilation with like Chrome mags and stuff. And my first job, I worked at a lumber yard and there was like hate breed posters and like some of the guys I worked with were like into like metal and hardcore and stuff. Yeah. And again, like, I didn't know it was hardcore. I just thought it was like metal and stuff, but like there was a bit, a bit more to it. Sure. Um, where were the posters like, yeah. in the in the lumber yard yeah like guys like there was i remember hate breed perseverance poster being on one part of the warehouse and then another <laughs> part had another hate breed like megadeth posters and stuff like that yeah um cool. and then uh what else uh, oh yeah like uh tony ox pro skater or underground 2 had like uh like 25 to life like was the opening track and stuff like you know stuff like that yeah. so just all kind of like made sense and then uh when I was 18, I went to, um, to, uh, Finger Lakes for school for a year. I originally, I went for uh, music production. Okay. Um, I did not stick with that. <laughs> that was like a disaster year for me. Like I was like, started like, you know, like doing ass and like skipping class and just like, you know, it's just being an idiot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And then, uh, but I, my roommate was like really into Slipknot. So we connected with that and they were kind of like death core and stuff and like, so I kind of started listening to like some of that stuff and we started a band and, um, our band ended up opening for, uh, us life ruiner, the Mongoloids, but they never showed up. Uh, uh, rhinoceros. They're like a, a straight edge band from Buffalo. Um, knock them dead. They're like a eulogy records band from Florida. And then like a bunch of other bands. And that was like my first kind of experience to like a, like an actual like hardcore show. Like it was like, you know, like there's like a lot, a lot of like hardline straight edge was kind of like a thing right. in upstate and stuff. And that was just like, that was like that intensity that I would had been looking for. Mm-hmm. It was like, I mean like playing sports and stuff, like, you know, I, I, I wasn't like, like I was a jock, but I wasn't like one of those jocks. You know what I mean? Like I, I wasn't like one of the cool popular guys, like even like on my hockey team, I still had like animosity with people and like, on the field, like that was my place, like the, or on the ice was like the place where I could like, you know, <laughs> kind of level people out and like, you know, um, straighten them out and, and just like, you know, going to hardcore shows and like still having that love for like, you know, physical contact, <laughs> you know, yeah. and violence and stuff like that. And uh, intensity, um, seeing like a hardcore show for the first time, I was like, you know, it's hooked. And like, and honestly, my first show was not like, uh, like, a super happy moment. <laughs> like there was like fights and stuff. Like it was just like, man, I was like, hey, this is fucking crazy. Like I was, I was like, this is back when like, like a fight would happen. Like 10 people would like jump one person. Like that almost happened to me a couple of times in that show. <laughs> it's right. just like, damn, this is fucking crazy. And like, I remember after that show being like mad, but also like so stoked. Yeah. <laughs> and just like, since then, just like, yeah, just fucking haven't, uh, was hooked, you know? Yeah. No, and I, I think there's some, you know, especially when you're at a certain age and you see something that's like so foreign to you in, in like a energy, but like also like a, a violence side of it. Yeah. Like I think the, or just that like sense of danger maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause the very first like, you know, like hardcore show that I went to was um, it was Means's last uh, Winnipeg show. Yeah, uh, on their way back to Regina to play their last show. So, I, I talked about this on the uh, Cole from Trench podcast. But you know, there was kids. It was in like a church basement, so there was kids like you know climbing on one another. But all the ceiling panels were like getting yeah. un- undone. And I remember it was destroyed, right? <laughs> yeah, I remember vividly. Uh, someone had moshed into the uh, one of the PA systems and it was falling. And as a group, we were catching it. And I don't know, that just kind of stuck with me as far as just yeah. like, I've never experienced this. And this is the only place that I can experience that level of, you know, ex- like uncontrollable 
you know, chaos in a way. Yeah. And I, I think it was like, honestly, kind of healthy for me to kind of have a place where like, I could still continue to like, let that rage out in a, you know, constructive manner, I guess you could say, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, yeah, super thankful for that, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do. So I do want to get to the, uh, um, you know, some of the first shows and, and things like that, but to, to quickly, uh, jump back to you you're bringing up Tony Hawk and I think that's yeah. uh I I full heartedly agree those were formative years as far as games that I played do you have a favorite Tony Hawk game that either it's only because of the soundtrack or like gameplay wise you think is also super tight I mean Tony Hawk 2 I think was definitely like a very legendary one for me like soundtrack wise one of the, the first one I played. So, I mean, I, I definitely got a special place in my heart for that one, but I also really liked underground too, as well. Cause it, you know, you could like do the graffiti and there's a lot more right. to it. And again, they're also kind of like destroying stuff on their, <laughs> on their way, you know, throughout that tour. Right. Yeah. So I, I think that was pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah, I'd say but between those two for sure. Yeah. For for me it was uh Pro Skater 3. Um I think I, I yeah. must have just missed the boat on on 2, but really, you know, 3 ha- I think had a just as good soundtrack. Um, yeah, totally. Um I mean they had uh Del the Funky Homo Sapien, uh, Ace of Spades. Yeah, yeah, uh the Red Hot Chili Peppers song on that was fucking rad. Yeah, that, I remember I had that one too. That was awesome. Yeah. If I if I didn't say 2 or or Underground 2, that would be my yeah. my other <laughs> And then I, I can't really recall the actual um, uh, the actual soundtrack, but American Wasteland I feel doesn't get the love that it deserves. No, as American far as Wasteland like, was fun too. As far as like story wise, I feel like yeah. you know the the Tony Hawk um, agenda as far as like you, here's your world, you got to mm-hmm. do a couple different missions, but that felt a little bit more. Um, there was because you could like go. It. There was just so much more to explore with that right you know, which I thought was awesome also like uh, thinking back on like how you're in this one world and you're just connected to it with like a mall that you're just yeah through, yeah like you're like yeah that makes sense <laughs> um, and i think i think i guess i was the last one i played though i don't think they really did too much after that though right um i think that there was but you know they the i think they got trapped in the uh you know when like the wii and stuff was coming out where it's like oh physical things are the future of of video games and And then like skate came in and that was kind of a game changer too yeah you just kind of left tony hawk pro skating the dust to a degree yeah like unless there's a super big tony hawk uh pro skater fan that wants to correct the record in the comments but (laughs) otherwise like um those games still hold up but but shouts out to Tony Hawk, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Tony Hawk's Broski. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's sick. Um, so going back, um, so you had your first show experience. Um, yeah, that was the first show that you had ever played. Well, I, I've been to like concerts. Like when I was fourteen, I went to see, like I'd go see Corn and Mudvayne. Yeah, uh, you know, would see Disturbed, Godsmack, Slipknot, all all that kind of stuff. And then I had friends that were like in punk bands um, in high school, and I'd like go to a couple of their shows, but like that was the first time I had experienced like a hardcore show. Right. Um, I mean, well, yeah, like a, an actual hardcore show. Like I had played shows with like some hardcore dancing with like metalcore bands and stuff, like being on the same bill as them, but like, yeah. you know, I was kind of still into push moshing and then, <laughs> but that was the first time I'd like seen like hardcore dancing. I think I like just started like hardcore dancing, like right before that, that show. And like that was the first time I kind of like was in like a real pit. I got I got smoked in the mouth. That's <laughs> like dropped on my ass. And, right. But yeah, it was it was intense, man. It was sick though. Yeah. So as far as um maybe you can kind of because I think there's a lot to unpack with a uh, DPK, but um, yeah, maybe you can kind of because I think most most things for people to kind of step up to a higher level of involvement in their scene is usually a self imposed like mm-hmm. thing it's not like someone knocked on my door and said hey spencer can you come and film this show? yeah it's totally. like something i just wanted to do so talk to me about how 
the thoughts of like putting on shows or, and initially entered your mind? Cause I'm sure you never thought it would have ex escalated to the to point that it yeah, is. Yeah. I mean, even like before that, I mean, what's great about hardcore is it does kind of uh, make, you know, like everything's kind of like attainable. Like, you know, it does kind of compel people in their scene to like be involved, like start bands and, you know, you can start a zine, you can film like there's, I mean, I can barely play guitar, but I've been in bands for, you know, like years, like, you know, it's not like this unattainable thing, like, but uh, yeah, going back to that. So when I first moved to Vancouver, um, it was a bit of a culture shock to me to see how shows were here versus when I lived in New York. And when I first moved here, there was like not really any hard, active hardcore bands. I, like I had just missed that, like, uh, golden era of like when going alone and stuff was going like grave maker was still playing but not really active yeah sure i think i only saw them like once or you know like they played once when i first moved here which was a great show but like again still just very different you're on the tail end of it yeah, yeah, yeah. so like when i first moved here it was like no one really like no one really mosh it was just like just such a night and day difference and so that kind of was weird to me and like I was going to a couple shows and like I feel like the way they were put on were just weird and the bands were weird and not really good. And there weren't really yeah, no like hardcore bands. Like I was going to like metalcore shows and stuff just because there there was really nothing else to go to. Sure. Um and uh sorry. And um yeah, and I just like I didn't really like how things were being run. And there was like shows where like I was getting kicked out because of the way I was moshing and stuff like that. And I was like, this kind of sucks. I kind of want to do, I'm going to do my own thing and make it how I want it to be <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And like, and that's like, with that being said, I mean, to anybody, like if you don't like the way something is going on in your scene, do something about it. Like right. start your own thing. Like you, there's, there's so much room um, within the music scene. There's so many different subgenres that you can create, like, so many different sub scenes within one scene, you know, that doesn't, there's no uh, law that says this is the scene and that's it. No one else, you know, can right. do anything about it. Um, so um, when I first started doing shows um, again, I read an article by Brian Skiffington who did Rainfest, and one of the quotes, um, I'm going to quote it loosely, but like, he said, you know, all you need for shows is, is four walls and a PA, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And that stuck with me. It was like, it really is like so simple to put on a hardcore show. Like you really don't need much. And Vancouver had gone through like a bunch of different venues and like venues were opening up, shutting down like super quick. And then three, three, three kind of started, you know, being a spot for shows, excuse me. And then, um, so I asked around and like talked to, to uh chris merrill so he ran it originally um and like you know he like yeah i was super down with me putting on shows there um they were pretty lax with like their rules you know so like it kind of made like you know you've been like you you've been to three yeah you've been to three, three, three. yeah like, you, yeah it's the, like the pre-show for the five year yeah so like it has it had that potential to have that raw vibe which is i think is so important like for hardcore shows to be authentic you know like and there's like at bars and it's like there's like rules and stuff and bouncers and all you know it's it's just not the same right could could you kind of uh provide some kind of for anyone who had had has never been to 333a but also just like any could you just kind of describe it as far as like location wise like yeah. what what 333 actually is like it's not the actual name of the venue it's just kind of that was deemed yeah venue? so it's the, it's the address just 333 <laughs> yeah. and we just call it i think originally i heard back in the day it was called the monkey pit oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah i think it so i've also like heard rumors that it was like it's been a, it's actually had like several um incarnations i guess i don't know if that's a proper term but like of it being a venue in the past like sure so, um but it's like in the industrial part of town like there's really like there's a car garage next to it i mean for years but until people knew what it was people would be like is it a car garage like <laughs> yeah, like am i in the right spot um but it's literally just like it's a you know you walk up to it it's just like a a gate like door like and then it looks kind of grungy and you get inside and it's literally just like a warehouse yeah. kind of room not too big and it's just you know kind of greasy and you know 
cinder blocks and spray paint everywhere and you know yeah <laughs> yeah and it was it was awesome it was the best <laughs> so so was was kind of that your plan to kind of like okay can i lock down a venue that's not necessarily mine but this is where this is going to be my default for all the shows that i put on i mean is it that- just kind of like made me comfortable with being like okay this is a spot i can do this at sure you know and like i wouldn't have problems and you know it was, it was relatively cheap to book as well so just like the ac- accessibility and it would do all ages that was another thing i missed right when i first moved here like all the shows were bar shows mm. um all like 19 plus and i feel like that was kind of the issue is there was like this gap there was like no passing of the torch between like generations i guess you could say in yeah. vancouver and it was just like kind of you know there's no place for any young kids to go to see shows and that's why with dpk it's always been you know a big principle of ours to have all ages shows because you gotta you know you gotta bring in the next generation and grow and cultivate and yeah. you know make things bigger um so that was yeah that was the big thing is like making it making sure we had an all ages spot um to you know have shows at. yeah um and then you know like in the in in the initial days as far as like dpk that was just you like because um you know something else that you know if someone is looking at it you know and not doing their research is they might just think it's just you versus nowadays like dpk is multiple yeah people. so it's kind of like a group so so the first the first show i did i did it by myself um i had i had graham do the i've always had graham do my posters like since day one right um and uh <clears throat> excuse me and like the first one we did it was like like a johnny canuck kind of doing like moshing through a brick wall kind of <laughs> we kind of had that theme for the first couple shows um and for those who don't know what johnny canuck is he's like the original like vancouver canucks kind of logo um so just yeah just kind of like a dude like moshing through a wall yeah. um and uh yeah so i had graham do the poster um I was trying to not realizing I needed float, not realizing I needed to run door while also answering questions and delegating and making sure bands are putting their stuff and setting up at the right time. So like, I realized I kind of needed to be in like five spots at once. And it was kind of, kind of a nightmare, um, super stressful. Um, but (laughs) yeah, it was, it was a learning curve. So that first show, yeah, I I was like kind of, running around with a chicken with his head cut off, but it was, it was still a sick show. Do you remember uh, who played that show? Yeah. So, um, Undertaker, Calgary band, um, Jordan, uh, what's his last name? Uh, Davis. Yeah. Message me and was like, Hey, I want you to do the show. And that's like, you know, before I was like doing really doing shows, he just like messaged me and was like, okay. Um, so again, like all, all these things kind of happening at once. And I finally was like, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do it um who else played uh tongue tied played and that's like some of the guys from your problem are in it sure um hunter who sang in policy of truth he was he sings in it uh and some other guys from north fan um map the north they're a pop punk band um your problem was supposed to be on it but they they like had a quick like played like one or two shows and then broke up for a couple years and then they came back but uh then ended up being leveler and that was like John from your problem was in that. Um, they were kind of like more like melodic hardcore. They were, they were sick. They played a lot of my shows in the first couple of years. And then uh, Father's Lungs opened. And that was like Ravi's band, Ravi and Andy's band in Kelowna. And before that, they had Cold Sleep. So like I was friends with them and I was asking Cold Sleep to come play. And they're like, oh, Cold Sleep's not really doing anything, but we have our new band if you want us to come play. And they played their first show the night before in Kelowna, which I also drove out for that. Oh, cool. And then drove back to do the Vancouver show. <laughs> Excuse me. But yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was the first show. And then, so with that initial learning experience, um, <laughs> did you think about getting other people involved with the cause right away or did, was it a few iterations um, after that? Yeah. So I, I don't remember exactly like no one lived in Kelowna at the time. And I think by the time I did the next show, he had moved to Vancouver and we had maybe talked about him helping out. Mm -hmm. Um, And then 
Kyla volunteered to do door a couple shows later. And uh, yeah, that was, that was it from there. It's just us four. Yeah. Cool. Since then. Um, and you mentioned earlier about uh, Graham, the yeah. guy who's doing your posters and that's something like that. I thought, I don't know if that was a strategical move as far as like, yeah, let's have like the same artwork for all of our yeah. shows. Cause you know, you can go on any like promoters a- account and it's like, um, you know, the, the lineup could be sick, but yeah. it's kind of like watered down with maybe the design of, of the poster. Well, that's, um, that's another thing where we like, I had in mind too. It's like, <clears throat> you know, there's like gotta be like a vibe to everything, right? Like the yeah. posters gotta kind of like draw your attention, you know, be a conversation starter more than just like a piece of paper with bands on it. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, right. So like it w- was thought out and not thought out. I mean, like Graham was a design student at the time yeah. and I wanted to give him an opportunity to, you know, get his name kind of out there a bit. And since then he really has, I mean, like he's gotten a lot of business from other bands and like people are always hitting him up. He's doing like commission pieces and stuff, right? you know, which is great for him. Um, but you know, like, I remember like when he was a student, like he would do like, and I'm sure a lot of artists do this, like he'd draw like a, a reaper every day of the year kind of, or like every day for X amount of days or something. Sure. And so that was kind of an excuse for like a lot of reaper stuff was like in the, the first, you know, for a few shows, you know, similar, you know, similar themes. And then we kind of like expanded on things. Like once things kind of got boring or stale for us, like we're like, let's, let's try and do stuff. And we're like, the first little while we used to always kind of brainstorm like cool ideas to like have, and then have Graham draw it. And then, yeah, we just, uh, and maybe yeah. like a, you know, more recent example of that is like when that sanction tour was announced, like yeah. the broken and refraction, like it was really cool. Cause sometimes it's like, here's the tour, here's the official tour poster. And then like someone totally goes a different direction, but yeah. at least from what I saw, Graham like took that and then Almost just has kind of a similar theme, but it's his own vibe too. Right. Yeah. Um, I've, I've really loved what he's done the last couple of years with some of those like more digital posters, like the, the trapped under ice poster we did a few years ago, like that one sticks out. Um, but, uh, there's just, I mean, you look back, there's a, there's a few that are just like, they're just so cool to look at. Like, right. They're awesome. And they have like, you know, themes from the band. Yeah. But not necessarily like we ripped off, like here's the agent being like, here's the ad mat. Right. You know, use this. And like, that's just slapping our info on it. Like he definitely like elaborated and did his own thing. It was just really cool to have that uh, creative intuition. Yeah. Yeah. And like one that sticks out to me now that I'm thinking about it is the, uh, the five year just with Mm -hmm. like all the different little, uh photos of the bands yeah the within like, glass. The glass. like that was a like he yeah he blew me away with that idea mm-hmm. and even just like him mentioning it versus like the way the final product i mean the final product's awesome yeah yeah he, he killed it yeah and and maybe we can kind of touch on that because that like um <clears throat> you know as far as like when like i started scope and when scope was like kind of more I guess, based in Calgary, like once I had moved here, um, yeah. I think like things with Vancouver were already like kind of turning up. And, um, I, I wish that I honestly was able to make it out there more to capture more shows, um, than I did. But the one that I, you know, was very adamant that I needed to be there, uh, was the DBK five year. And yeah. I, I'm, I feel like anytime I talk to anyone about that, they're like, they're almost like dumbfounded on how great of a feat that is as far as doing five shows in three days. Um, so can you kind of talk about like, um, you know, like your anniversary shows in the past were kind of a longer day, days yeah. worth of bands, but what was the idea as far as um, doing something that elaborate? Um, I mean, it kind of started as something that kind of, uh, snowballed into this much bigger thing. I mean, uh, so like you, as you saw with like the four year, it was just like, you know, like a day show. Um, it's like, you know, kind of like baby stepping into like big, a bigger event, right. Testing out how would something like this work in Vancouver? Cause Vancouver is a very different market from, um, any, you know, most other cities. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the four year was just like a one day show with like a mix of bands um, I wanted to highlight like Canadian bands and like Vancouver and the Northwest and stuff. 
And then through the five year, I had uh, just like um, John McRae, who sang Grave Maker. He like he was like his buddy was buddies with Integrity and was asking about uh, playing, you know, getting someone to book a show for them in Vancouver. So I had booked Integrity before the four year even happened. Oh, wow. so it was a full year in advance. And when I kind of like got all the pricing down i looked i was like oh this is not gonna work as a one-day show <laughs> like i'm gonna need to make this like so much bigger to be able to pay for this yeah and uh i mean but I, with that being said i wanted i always wanted to do something big for the five year and i always you know i wanted to again push myself to like like doing a fest had become one of my goals in the couple years leading up to that also leading up to that i mean I did go to business school for like a short stint. I didn't like finish, but like I did some like economics and like marketing and entrepreneurship classes. I also did uh, like uh, artist or art management and entertainment management course for that. So I kind of had learned a bit more Sure, yeah. that like help, like really helped with DPK. Like again, like marketing and just like, you know, imagery and just like, you know, what makes it more than just us kind of, um yeah but uh yeah so like we booked integrity and i realized like this needs to be so much bigger than than uh what i had originally planned like it's not going to work at three through three um so in- integrity one, at three through three would be like insane a black yeah. hole as far as- <laughs> <laughs> and I, I i've always wanted to have like just some absurdly large band play three through three just like just like I, I wanted so bad to have like tariff play three through three or so. right. just something just ridiculous, like absurd, like right. just really push that that uh, little room to its limits. Um, but again, I mean, having three through three involved was super important to me. So we did the pre shoot pre show there. Um, the Astoria, or excuse me, the Biltmore had a really nice room, but they did the nineteen plus, and I compromised on that for the night shows because I mean, who's under 19 that listens to integrity like honestly yeah no. that's fair <laughs> i mean there's i'm sure there's a handful but not really right um so like i kind of compromised like okay like i'll do like the night show there um they had the room upstairs where we did like the day show and i kind of like i mean with some hindsight i kind of wish i did things a little bit differently like i kind of wish i did like the pre-show and the matinee shows at 333 seeing as like the numbers that actually ended up coming versus like what i had projected sure yeah um and then same with like the night shows. Like, I think it would have been a lot cooler to have me have like three 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 for the matinee shows, and then maybe like the Astoria for the evening shows because that's like a little bit tighter. I think they're like close to each other, only a block away from each other. And I think just like we wouldn't have had the curfew restriction yeah, like yeah. fucking with us, and like pricing would have been better. So yeah, I just I I think you know in hindsight, yeah, maybe cut the the amount of bands down just a little bit. <laughs> It kind of, again, just kind of like, oh, fuck, I'm like snowballing here and just going. And, going and was that up. more like you were just putting out inquiries and then bands were like, yeah, we do it. And then it's like, oh, crap, we've booked. Over yeah, I mean, like bands. there was there was always like I, I had like done like a mock draft list of bands um, a year earlier and then like edited it and, you know, like I had some bands I asked like that far off in advance some bands would be like, okay, ask us again in a couple months. That's pretty far away. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I had talked to Theo from hands of God about like them coming up well in advance. Cause like, as you know, getting bands to come up to Canada is like pulling teeth. So like, yeah. um, I wanted to kind of give them as much incentive and notice as possible to make it happen. Um, but he was really great about getting a few more, getting me in contact with like more California bands and like, they set up like this, this tour to come up. So like we have like, like six California bands on the, the fest. Yeah. Which is rad. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just, you know, giving incentive to kind of make stuff like that happen. And then like wanting to have uh, Canadian bands, like it's, I, I always think it's so important to, um, I guess, uh, what's the word I want to just show off like Canadian bands. Cause like, again, like I don't think Canadian bands get the recognition they deserve. Right. And I wanted to, you know, create a platform where they get some some notice. Um, and then f- found out uh, the Dom, who plays in Integrity, he's actually originally from Canada. Oh. And then, <laughs> so that was cool. And then uh, Comeback Kid, you know, they're Canadian. Originally, it was actually supposed to be Misery Signals for that second day. 
and then they they unfortunately drop and come back and play. But and if Misery Signals played that second day, it would have been just. I think that would have been amazing. But yeah. you know, again, like what do you do, right? Yeah, yeah. you got to roll with yeah. the punches sometimes. Yeah, and I'm sure yeah, like, I'm sure, like there's um, been a, a few like you know, like I have very limited experience with like doing our own shows, but like. Mm-hmm quickly realizing on how much it is just a firefighter mentality like okay like i can't you know have any like emotional ties to something falling through and just have to figure you, you out can't, you can't break down like dude you just gotta like okay you got a problem what's the solution right constantly find solutions don't dwell on it it happens whatever yeah. move on move on find a solution yeah. don't don't sit and because you'll make yourself crazy you won't get anything done yeah it's not the way to do it um what was maybe one thing that happened during that um that five-year weekend that was kind of like either like a a highlight for you or was also like a i can't believe this is happening or um i mean how smooth it went (laughs) honestly like i expect like i was stressing leading up to because i had so much money on it but right i thought it was gonna be like a stressful weekend i was gonna be running around it ended up being like really smooth and a really good time. Like I was actually able to like hang out with people mm-hmm. and everything for the most part went really smooth. Um, but I mean, right before integrity, I mean that vibe before they played was like so cool, just like full room. Like it almost felt like, like this, like in a, in a weird way, like this darkness, like that, like integrity was like doing some witchcraft in the side room. It was like <laughs> conjuring this evil in the room, but it's just like, but in, in such a sick way, you know, you kind of like felt this vibe right before they played. Um, and just like, yeah, just, I mean, everything kind of coming together was just like awesome. Um, the pre-show was awesome. Not to toot my own horn, but the juice set was like, that exceeded my expectations. Like, Oh yeah, that people really stage rad. diving and moshing just during the sample at the beginning. Yeah, it was yeah. like, and we, like, we, uh, Tony brought that up, like literally like, as we were loading in, he's like, yo, it's the samples. Like, okay. Like, I didn't realize it was like over a minute long. Yeah. Um, it ended up being really cool. Um, Swarm beating set was like so sick. Um, yeah. Just like, it was, yeah, it was dope, man. Like. What was, what was your favorite uh, set for, from a band that, you know, maybe isn't of that integrity level, like a smaller name that maybe played their first time in Vancouver. Uh, Swarm beating for sure. Yeah. Um, meantime set was dope. Yeah. Um, Dying Wish had a really rad set. I remember that being really cool. Uh, Drain, I think, turned a lot of heads. Oh, wow. uh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Serration set was cool. Um. I, I have I, uh, to attest, yeah. like you, you mentioned how like Theo, you know, you know, planned a tour to bring up more California bands, and and there was even just like friends of theirs from California that just made yeah. it to come out to support them. But, um, you know, seeing No Right play, um, yeah, in Vancouver, and I was like, oh, I have to figure out a way that I can get this band to play well, Calgary, and then ultimately we booked them for the the two year anniversary. And, and, and I mean, the first time I saw them, I saw them in Portland a year or two years before that mm. and like didn't know anything about them i thought they're gonna be like a whatever band and then i watched them play and i was just blown away like they fully impressed me and i was just like wow this band's like really sick yeah um and again just like another california band i wanted to reach out to and see if they would be into it and they were you know they flew themselves up and it was like fucking awesome like a lot of bands really did like they weren't like, oh, you need to pay for flights and like our hotel. Like a lot of bands were really great. We're just like down to fucking down, down for the core, you know, yeah. <laughs> just down to make something happen. And like, I can't thank those people enough. I mean, that's, that's what makes hardcore really happen. Right. Yeah. And, and maybe cause you know, myself and, and Jessa and Nikki who, who are putting on these anniversary shows, you know, like we've tried to um, have the attitude where, if we figure out our headliners and things like that, and we're asking certain bands, um, we're not wanting to necessarily like use that as bait to get yeah. other bands to like play. Yeah. It's, it's more yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. So like, is, was that kind of the same thing for that integrity show? Cause I remember specifically, um, uh, blame God played and they were like, I had no idea integrity was playing this. So this is like super rad. 
Well, I think they they knew Integrity was playing. They just didn't realize they were playing the actual Integrity. Oh, I see. Show. I see. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, playing God, like I, again, like a show. They played a show like like a, in the November pr- that prior to that that a uh, couple months earlier. Sure. And I just went like it wasn't really a show like I was like dying to go to, but I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna go for the fuck of it, hang out. I got nothing to do. And like they were fucking awesome. Um, so I ended up talking to the guys from that band. And uh, the singer, I don't know if he's a singer anymore, but he, uh, you still there? Uh, yeah, we're just slightly oh, frozen. Let's just wait till it comes back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're good. Back? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you know where that cut out? Or no, was... I just uh, yeah, we. Could... You just said uh, you were talking to the singer. You don't know if he's yeah. the singer still anymore. And then, uh, yeah, but he, I think, helped put up. He was a promoter out in New York as well. Yeah, um, I think he he mentioned that he helped put on that uh, Binghamton Fest. Okay, which is like a little okay. upstate, a little thing that happened a couple of years. Um, yeah, we're just you know we're just talking like cause, you know being being from New York, just shooting the shit. And, um, yeah. And I was just like, Oh, I'm like a promoter here. And I, he's like, Oh, like what shows have you put on? I was like, I put on like terror and vein, like bigger, you know, some bigger stuff. And uh, I mentioned that I was like, you know, we like, uh, exchanged Instagram info and he saw that I was putting on the integrity show. I was like, Oh dude, that's fucking rad. Like I saw that, you know, whatever. And I was like, Oh, like, you know, would you guys maybe want to like come out and play? Like, <laughs> just like see it. Like, again, they were kind of like, the grind bands they're like they don't fucking care about money <laughs> they just they just right. want to rock right. and like dude they flew themselves out and like played like three northwest shows that weekend and they asked for a hundred dollars i was like <laughs> like yeah. blown away um but rad band and i again i put them on that 19 plus show to kind of like because they're a bit more metal maybe show them off to like a more metal crowd and like feel like they would fit that that bill really well um yeah they were fucking rad dude like <laughs> Yeah, and and I'm guessing like with the amount of bands that played that weekend, it was like once you had everyone confirmed, you're like, okay, like how do I kind of structure things so there is diversity for some shows, but like you know, like you putting like Living with Lions and Comeback Kid kind of on the same bill, like yeah. it made sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I definitely I did a bunch of mock drafts um, throughout the time when I was booking it. Like you know, just like okay, would this work here? Would this work here? Like seeing how things would stack up. Like, is this diverse enough? Is this where it makes sense? Is this band better on a 19 plus bill or versus all, yeah. excuse me, an all ages bill? And then I just messed around with that till everything kind of just fell into place. And then some bands had to be switched last second or whatever. But, you know, again, like one of those things you just, okay, no big deal. You, you do what you do it. Yeah. You know, cool. Make it happen. Yeah. Make it happen. Um, uh, so, to kind of shift gears a little bit, um, we've talked a lot about DBK, but obviously you play in some pretty uh, staple Vancouver hardcore bands right now. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> well, originally the so I was I was kind of figuring out things, and I think the very first time I had seen a band of of yours play live was Worldview, yeah, um, and that was at the Calgary Fest in 2017. But um, were you playing bass for throwing bricks a few years prior to that? Yeah. So I, I started throwing bricks. Um, again, that was kind of like one of my first Vancouver bands. Um, the guys from take heart. Yeah. A couple of those guys were getting into heart, like more hardcore stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. And they were just, uh, they're like, hit me up. Like, yo, like, would you want like interested in jamming? Like, I don't want to do like, some, you know, more straight up hardcore. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So like, um, first I was jamming with Dig and Julian and then we needed someone to play drums. So Jeff kind of would just jam with us and then like ended up becoming the drummer and like we needed a vocalist and then Dane just kind of ended up doing the, <laughs> doing the vocals. Like, yeah. and, uh, yes, yeah, so we just like became a band and played shows for a little bit. And like, that was kind of like, again, for, like Vancouver for a while, didn't just have like a straight up hardcore band at all for a long time. Yeah. So that was like, one of those bands where it's like not that like I ever really want like expected anything to happen with that, but like I just wanted like a hardcore band to just play. So we would just like open yeah. a bunch of shows that I could put on just so like you know it's an easy like okay I can fill this bill like we'll put, well we'll open and then I can fill all the other slots like right. <laughs> yeah, and that was that was kind of funny because I was playing in a metalcore band uh, in Winnipeg and I think. 
I don't think they toured with Take Heart, but they for sure played a few shows with them. Oh, yeah, they played, uh, was it Cold Front or something? Oh, it Cold was called Forever I. Forever I. Yeah. They, play, they toured with another Winnipeg band. It was like a pop punk band that was like cold. It's called something. I yeah. I'm trying to think. Was it more yeah. pop punky? I think so. Okay. Yeah. There, yeah. If someone knows, uh, comment it below. But um, yeah, it was like I remember when I met those dudes, and uh, I think it was Julian. Like I became friends with like right away, and yeah. then he was like posting uh, photos of like throwing bricks i'm like this is your band but some other dude is playing bass like this is crazy yeah yeah it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's literally take heart but me and jordan switched spots pretty much right, right. um but before that i mean i, I played bass in slumlord for a couple tours oh okay cool and uh the first band i played in when i first moved here was uh deadbeat and that was slumlord before slumlord basically but it was gotcha. more yeah deadbeat not not dead yeah. heat. Yeah. Yeah, dead heat. Yeah, yeah. And apparently right. there's a dead beat from California now, but <laughs> we, yeah. yeah. Not the most yeah. original name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um I was talking with someone on another podcast about like there's like just there's just multiple band names. Like I did a I did one with uh someone in the UK and there's like a plead yeah. that's from here, but he yeah. also films a plead out in the UK. I'm like, oh yeah. I think it's fine if it's on the other side of the world. Yeah, <laughs> it's like when things get like a bit bigger, then maybe you can argue about yeah. whatever. Like there's another worldview in Australia. Yeah. But you know, yeah. Now there's <laughs> well, like, you know, like I feel like every band from Texas will just throw TX at the end of their name. So yeah, yeah. God forbid if there's like a duplicate situation, yeah. just TX it yeah um, we've been we threw bc on our spotify because otherwise you can't find us <laughs> produce <laughs> right so um yeah thousand. worldview like really like took off for for a while and then you guys kind of hit pause for a bit and most, yeah most recently came back um yeah so was uh maybe you can talk a little bit about that band because i don't know if like juice just kind of like um came to be in the ashes of that and now it's like both bands are fully active so now it's like oh like crap <laughs> no no crap uh but like so um i mean worldview kind of came out of the ashes of throwing bricks and take heart to a degree i mean sure. um because worldview has has jeff who played in both bands um so i mean like like jeff's a rad drummer and like great dude to be in a band with like sorry um he uh so he i don't know if andy andy had moved to vancouver and he like i said he played in father's lungs and yeah cold yeah. sleep and he was doing shows in Kelowna. <clears throat> moved to vancouver he was jamming with jeff at the jam space where throwing bricks was i had started Towards the end of throwing bricks, I was kind of over and I was starting to write new songs too. Um, and then uh, Jordan from Take Heart was playing bass. We Spencer had also moved to Vancouver from Edmonton. And again, they were all we were like we were talking about starting a band, and then you know everything just kind of fell fell into place. They asked me to come play guitar, um, and like that was the first band I like. I mean, I guess good band I played guitar, and I was playing bass and all the other bands up until then. Right. Um, and I mean, I could, <laughs> again, I could barely do a power chord, but I was able to, to last a little bit. And then I, eventually I was able to actually kind of play a bit better, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. So, I mean, we, but like, what was really cool about that band when it started is like, everyone had like, was driven and like had experience and just really good ideas and everything just came together so well. And, uh, we just like got, a, well, we got asked to play with like cruel hand and stuff. And we just like planned our demo right before that and like just you know hyped it up not too like i'm I'm really into like not into like hyping stuff up but just like there's like a subtle like if you do it like just subtly like like before like the day before like the week before we put out our demo i just released like the logo of like the the knife in the planet like no no name or anything just yeah. just that yeah. and that got like a hundred likes on facebook like <laughs> you know like you know didn't say anything more just, mysterious just than like yeah things and, coming yeah yeah and i think just like that made things kind of like oh there's like you know this something's happening you know and like um and uh yeah and then we put we put our demo like a couple days for that show 
And there was a video of our first show, but I think it got deleted, unfortunately. But that was, I mean, it just popped off for us. It was really great. And then uh, we, we uh, planned a weekend tour around it because we were playing Times Tide uh, record release show in Edmonton. Oh, right. Okay. And we, so we just planned a weekend around it. So we played Kelowna <laughs> and uh, Calgary as well. And Calgary we played in, I think it was Nikki's basement and yeah, Trench. Right. That was Trench's first show. Right. Yeah. That was uh, at the, the trap house. Yeah. And then, uh, so Stepping Stone had, and Mortality were also playing Time Sides record release show. So it was like uh, Stepping Stone and Mortality almost did like a, a mini weekend tour at the end of it. And that kind of influenced uh, kind of like the new Alberta Fest kind of coming together. Cause I was like the first time, you know, we had maybe not the first time, but like first time in a while where it was like Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC had like a, a weekend thing kind of going on here. Right. Um, and then, yeah, like uh, the Alberta Fest kind of spawned out of that a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, a bit more unity within like the West, Western Canada started happening. And yeah, yeah. that's like kind of where like the Western Front like term kind of came out. And, like, and then people were like, because uh, that's like associated with something else. But it's not. <laughs> but it's not, yeah. Yeah. But like, I, do we- I do think that Wild Rose Hardcore Fest is like a... A, a very brand worthy kind of name versus yeah. like, you know, like yeah, Southern Alberta were, Hardcore Fest and, was like, yeah. you know, yeah, that is what it they're is. Clumsy, <laughs> what's the front? clumsy, but I mean, like at first it was like Keenan and Brandon were doing it. Yeah. When it was three and cities. I think Brandon and Evan were doing it and then Evan and the other guys took over and then unfortunately, you know, recipes Evan. Yeah. The other guys are carrying it on and like, the Wild Rose brand, I mean, just the way, like, last year was, like, you know, like, it takes a few years for things to kind of get going. Yeah. And, like, I feel like last year was, like, everything kind of just clicked together. Yeah. And, and, and last and, year was great. Yeah. It was too bad this year didn't happen because, I mean, it was, like, best lineup yet. I mean, it was, like, it was going to be nuts, I'm sure. Yeah. Like, I think that's, like, a very crucial thing as far as, like, can – like consistently like documenting either a band or a fest because you can see the progress with with the calgary fest through these videos now like yeah you know there's been changes as far as like venues and things like that but like Mm -hmm. you know bands get better year over year and just like looking at wild rose one if you will yeah when it was at the legion for the first time and looking at the year after it's like almost a nine day difference yeah yeah yeah. Well, it's, and, and like, you know, you learn from, okay, this didn't really work out. How can we fix, make it a bit better? Like they closed the room in a little bit and like mm-hmm. they made, made a world of difference. Um, having it all ages, again, making it more accessible to the younger crowd. Like now you guys have a whole crop of new kids coming in and starting bands and stuff and moshing. And that's, that's awesome. I mean, that's, that's why it's so important. Again, going back to like DPK a little bit, like the, when these big shows come through, it's like, this is an opportunity to, showcase local bands or you know to kids that maybe don't come to smaller shows what else is going on here mm-hmm. and they might not see so like if you make it 19 plus like you're you're kill you're killing your scene like you're not like every big tour because those big tours don't come through often even more so for calgary but yeah, that's yeah. that's a huge that's opportunity to you know get new kids involved and if you don't if it's 19 plus i mean they can't get involved right mm-hmm. Well, it's like, it's, you know, like I've, I've done a couple, like depending on when, th- when this is released with, with other episodes that I've recorded, but, you know, talking with, uh, I was talking with a, a promoter on the East coast, like PEI, like very, very East oh, Canada. Wow, yeah. And he was like, yeah, like, like the major, like once we started doing only all ages shows, like the, like the average age of people who are going to shows like dipped into the 14, 15, 16 yeah. versus like you or I in the later twenties, you know, even I feel like old guy now at my show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is good, but you know, but like that, that so my older needs coming back to be that. like, you know, it needs to have the youthful side of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, if like, cause eventually everyone gets old and you know, they don't have time and like, priorities change and it's like you know maybe the the spark dies out a little bit and they're you know for them mm-hmm. and like you know it's just not a priority to go to every show and mo- like the old guys aren't moshing it's the young it's the young kids who are moshing it's the young kids who have time and their parents money to start bands and stuff you know i mean like yeah 
you know, fucking, and they, you know, they can take a weekend off work or a week off work and go on tour. And like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like they, you know, just go, go, go for it. Yeah. You know, where it's like, you know, for me, I, I got, you know, I got to get married, you know, I got a career to worry about, you know, I can't, I can't be jumping in a van for a week or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so, so as far as like that, um, you know, as you get older and, you know, other priorities, you know, kind of sink in and, you know, have to make some calls as far as like, you know, getting a, a, a tour, um, that comes your way and you're like, I really can't, you know, tackle this, you know, due to a number of reasons and how, like, I, I remember you posting, just talking about like, if there's anyone that like wants to dive more into this, like I'll gladly, you know, help out how I can, as far as like giving you advice on how to book shows, how to talk yeah. to bands and, and things like that. Um, how, like, you know, has that been challenging for you as far as like, you know, wanting to, you know, like trying to keep your priorities in line, but also being like, you know, I love hardcore. Yeah. I mean, cause I, cause I've always kind of been like, Oh, I want to, you know, I just want to rock or like, I want, <laughs> you know, I, I always want to do that mm-hmm. more than anything. So I just, it is hard for me to kind of say no sometimes. Cause I just like, especially in the beginning, it's like, I want to do any show. I just like, just want to make stuff happen. Yeah be involved and like and to a degree i still like am like oh i don't want to stop doing shows like you know it's like it's my thing (laughs) but like you know you got to kind of let go a little bit and like move on like i'm you know like eventually you're gonna lose touch with what the kids are into like you know you need kid like i even like talk to kids i'm like you know it's it's fucking weird for me to go talk to like a 16 year old and be like hey man you into bands (laughs) in a metal (laughs) like you know like you're, you're, you're 20, you're 20. Go, you go talk to these kids. You go get them involved. Like, it's not this weird thing. You can, you can start a band with them, you know, do what I did to like, you know, to you. Like I, I was like, Hey dude, like, what's up? Like, you know, like you should like check out these bands or like, you know, like, Oh, I got like, you don't have merch. Like, Oh, I got, I'm, you know, I'm, I got to clean out my closet. Here's, here's a bag full of shirts that right. I don't wear anymore, whatever. You know what I mean? Like passing, passing it on is so important. <laughs> Um, especially like here and, you know, for you guys, like it's so fragile because we aren't in like this hub of activity, like LA or New York or something. So it's like, it's so important to like put that extra effort in and make sure this, this, uh, this stuff continues. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely like, I have, I do have a bit of a hard time like letting go, but like, I definitely know that it's like, it's kind of, um, I'll make, I've been making moves to like get younger guys like involved and, like the street Baptist kids going on, like they're starting to take over, you know, but like even before that, like they were starting bands like backbite and stuff. Like yeah. they're, you know, they're the ones watching every band and like buying merch and stuff. So it's just like, yeah. yeah and, and, and again, like I said earlier, like I think most of the act, like being involved is like a, you know, a self-imposed thing. Like, you know, like no one, ask me to do what I'm doing, but I know like what keeps me going is like, I know a lot of people would be like really bummed out if I like stopped filming bands, like full stop. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, I I even wonder like if I still lived in New York, like would I have, would I have like started doing stuff, you know? Cause like it's, it's there, like, you know, there's not much you really need to do. Like you can kind of just, you know, be a, a tour you know i just be a, a a watcher and right you know it's not as big of a deal where like here it's like you really got to kind of roll up your sleeves and get involved <laughs> yeah. yeah there's a little bit of like a um like there there's a little bit of like a necessary thing for both because i think yeah. if i still lived in winnipeg i probably wouldn't be as ambitious and like wanting to do as much as i can with scoped if like i didn't live like like a big reason for us to move to Calgary was like, well, I want to have the fest be in my backyard, so to speak. So I can just like yeah. plan for it better every year. Cause I had driven out or flew out for it like every other time. But as soon as I moved, it's like, okay, yeah. How I'm many years was it before you moved here? The uh, first couple of years you were driving out to film or. Yeah. So like I, <laughs> uh, so what I actually did is like, um, the company I worked for at the time, they had a Calgary office. So I would like, mm-hmm. we, had to be in Calgary to do like a, a like a shoot um, mm-hmm. like once in the summer so I'd always like 
oh, I can only do this weekend. It was like the weekend of the fest. So it's like I could like fly out, um, do the thing on the weekend, but like the week prior or the week after I could just be working there. Yeah. Um, so that was my way to hack that. Um, but I did that for 2016, 2017. And then I was, um, I think I did, I, I moved in 2018 of, is that right? Yeah. 2018 is when I was. So, so that would have been the, for the first year of. First year of Wild Rose. So that was like in the spring, but we moved yeah. in the fall. So, um, okay. yeah. Yeah. So again, it's, it's kind of crazy. Have you like, I know. I rem I I think I've told this story as well, but I remember right after comeback kid played the five year, I was like, "So you're gonna you're gonna do six shows next year?" And you're like, "No, fuck no, we're not doing that." <laughs> yeah, no, I, man. Like after la even now, I'm like that that burned me out so bad. Like yeah, like it was great, but it definitely put a sour taste in my mouth. And I'm like, man, I I am over this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but. I mean, but I still am like, I'm still like, I always got ideas in my head. Like, oh, I got, I got to do this. And like, I got to do that. Like I got, I got lots of ideas in my head that I want to, I still want to work on. Maybe I'll, you know, I've also talked to like, again, like street Baptist guys about maybe getting them to like do some of these things to like, right. so I can kind of, but I mean, I got lots of ideas in my head to like, again, grow the scenes in different directions, not necessarily just like hardcore, but like um, multi-genre, you know, kind of, events and stuff like that yeah um you know uh I, again like because where i'm from in new york is like not really it's like suburbs but a bit further you know it's not near like it's it's the hudson valley area so it's like you know it's it's out there okay um not the sticks but you know it's like it's not it's not manhattan right um and like i think it's important for vancouver to be healthy you got to make stuff happen out in like the suburbs and like Langley and Surrey and Chilliwack and Abbotsford and stuff. And there are bands come, you know, popping out of those areas, which is really rad. Yeah. But I, I think if you get shows happening out there and like more kids out there involved and stuff, like it's only going to make Vancouver a healthier scene. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a kind of no different if it was like Toronto is kind of like the bigger city, but then you have shows in Oakville, Brampton, yeah. Windsor, which, totally. which from, from my knowledge is happening right now, which is yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean like that, that last sanction show, uh, I did it in new West at the front there, like new venue, they were willing to do all ages, um, a little bigger. So, I mean, like, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to use this as an opportunity. Cause like all, where are the kids? They're on the suburbs. They're not, right. they're not downtown. Everyone downtown is like an art kid or in a hip hop or something, you know, they don't care. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I just, I always got like new ideas of like how to grow things going on in my head and just, yeah hopefully uh when all this stuff is over i can start working on them yeah for sure yeah it's yeah luckily that sanction like i remember because you know something that i've been trying to do is like okay if i can't physically be at a show can i still you know deem the the responsibility for someone else to film it and then i edit it um yeah because then it like 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 I know like there might be some videographers that might be like, well, like what about your quality control and things like that? And it's like, it's either like we get it filmed or we don't. That's yeah. how I look at it. Cause um, I, I could definitely see from your perspective, like definitely having that, like if you're not doing it yourself, it might not be done to your standard. And there's definitely that bit of like, uh, with that, but yeah. like at the same time, I mean, like it's really great that you're getting other people involved and like, filming these shows out here because like you know there's really rad, rad stuff happening out here and it like yeah. definitely needs to be documented yeah and like you know like i i've taken that approach and like i'm kind of planting my flag in the sand yeah. in that way because you know like i do think that they're you know like in hindsight like um that sanction show is probably one that I wish that I was, was able to go to. Like, um, I think the timing of, you know, no one could have really anticipated like the lack no. there of, of shows, but you know, like there are certain festival, like I I've told, I've told people straight up who invite me out to like festivals. And I'm like, if, if scope's not filming it, I probably can't go just cause like, Going yeah. out to a festival is like a lot of time away from home. It's a lot of money. A lot of money. Um, well, I mean, that's like kind of we. I mean, because Rainfest happened here for years and it was drivable, 
and like almost took that for granted. And that, then when Rainfest stopped, it's like, man, all these fests are like a flight away. I'm not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> it's way too much money and work. Yeah. So, you know, again, the way that I can hack it to at least be at a fest is like scopes involved and, you yeah. know, like I'm totally fine to like, um, you know, like, like snow and flurry is a great example where it's like, yeah. okay, we can, we can afford to fly at one of you. And then I was like, well, like, let's bring Cole and let's bring Jordan. And then we just figured it out so we can be there and just provide more value on the video side for them. So um, I, I got a question for you. So yeah. it was in Minneapolis this year, which is a bit further from Winnipeg, right? Yeah. So traditionally that festival and it was in Fargo and that was only like a three, four hour drive. Right. So would you like fly to Winnipeg and drive down or like, um, so that, or this is the first year you filmed it, right? This is the first year I filmed it, but I, there, the two years prior, there were like, I was in discussions with Jack and some of the other guys about filming it. Cause oh, okay. like I lived there. So I was like, yeah, I can drive down. Yeah, can no you problem. cover my gas and give me a place to stay? No problem. Yeah. And then of course that weekend, it's like a snowstorm and all the highways are closed. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second year I had just moved out here and I got like a new job and it was kind of like poor timing to like yeah, ask yeah. for time off. Um, but this year things lined up super well. And like, I'm, I'm really like that. Like every time I look at how, you know, our, our analytics. Cause I'm, I'm not like concerned about how many videos of like one, one specific video gets or how many views of a specific video, video gets, but mm. like just looking at it from the lifetime and seeing how the progression goes. And there's always like a little hill as far as like filming the five year filming new friends and yeah. Toronto, filming snow and flurry filming wild rose. So like festivals are like really crucial for us as far as like, getting new bands on the channel, getting a surge of like lots of content all at once. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as far as like snow and flurry, they did it in, uh, it's actually in Burnsville, Minneapolis. So that's like a okay. suburb just outside of Minneapolis. Okay. Um, I don't know if they're going to do it again in Burnsville, but like, I, like it's kind of no different if it was like Calgary and like Airdrie in a sense, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask more questions, but maybe I should. Yeah, <laughs> I guess yeah. I could call other well, things. We can, we can maybe chat about that after, but um, yeah. Uh, sweet. Well, we should probably aim to start kind of wrapping things up here, but um, maybe you can kind of just like, um, if there's any kind of things as far as I like, I think there's been a lot of like good, um, conversations around like booking shows and all ages and why that's important. Mm -hmm. But if you can kind of send off the listeners and the and the viewers as far as like um you know giving back and being involved in your scene and the importance of that um what would kind of be the one thing that's top of mind for you um i mean yeah like this has been a, a pretty amazing thing to happen to me like the first time i kind of felt like this is where i need to be and uh that you know it, it allows you to like kind of be involved and like you know the guy you know the people you see in bands they're not like rock stars and stuff like you can do it like even if you can't play an instrument pick up a bass that's what i was that's what i did i didn't grow up like a musical guy like yeah I, you know i learned how to play bass and then i end up you know i can kind of play guitar and i got people fooled on playing in a few bands you know you can do it like right. you can book a show it's not hard like you you ask around like the venues are usually down to help you like you know talk to your get your friends involved like you're i'm sure you got friends in bands like talk to them about doing shows or like you know like per, playing in a band with some of the you, you know your friends or whatever just like don't uh don't be a turtle like a turtle don't be shy like just ask and mm -hmm. yeah get involved like it's not you know it's not this like unattainable thing yeah yeah no, those are those are great words and i think that keyword in all that is just it like everything is attainable like yeah you know, perseverance to quote, Hey, yeah, Andrew, in a way. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> as far as, um, things coming up for your bands or DBK, is there anything you want to kind of tease? Uh, I mean, like, well, juice is trying to write an EP. We'll see what happens. Sure. Uh, I mean, we're working on it. it uh, I don't know if it's going to be soon or especially with what's going on, like it could take forever. I mean, worldview is trying to put out, 
some music and also write new music for later releases as well, possibly. Um, nothing, nothing too crazy right now. I just like, I do have some ideas like, you know, like I, I kind of want to do like almost like a warp tour kind of day show thing where it's like really mixed genres and like get people that wouldn't go to other shows to maybe come together and like, mm. you know, maybe you get at your other shows, you get a handful of those kids that would not have come out normally to, you know, they're, they experience people experience new things. Right. Yeah. So I definitely want to try and work on that in the future. Uh, we'll see what happens though. Yeah. Cool. Um, and kind of before, uh, you know, a, a bookend part of the podcast that we do, and I feel like there's going to be some good stories, um, just like a favorite show or mosh story, um, whether that directly involves you or just something that you witnessed at a show. Oh man. Um, I don't know. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stuff to pick from. Um, I mean, you're allowed to do multiple. I haven't restricted. Yeah. That. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've been really blessed and like played a lot of amazing shows and like put on or been to a lot of really amazing experiences. Like Bane's last show in Vancouver was amazing. Uh, some of the, like some of the first shows we did that had over a hundred people were pretty unreal. Like, um, I got, let me think. Um, I, I definitely like Oaks original last show. Yeah. Um, was the first time I kind of did like a, a two day, not like fast, but like multiple bands happening over two days. And, uh, we had like a bunch of us had like chains and stuff or like lighting off fireworks and <laughs> just like smash and shit. That was dope. Um, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's, it's so hard to choose one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Just, uh, I'm sure you can look through your videos and see some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like you just demolishing that kid during all out war at Wild Rose. Yeah. That was funny. That, I'm actually, that's so funny that you got that clip perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Like I think, um, you know, to, to go back to the five year one more time, I think the, the one shot of, um, blanking on his name, but just getting like booted in the face. Um, oh uh dustin dustin yeah, yeah. During that <laughs> super funny lower species set like yeah. those are things that like you can't plan they just like totally happen all at once so yeah um, it's pretty amazing that you're able to capture them right like yeah yeah because so. it, it's because i always say like there's you know there's funny moments like that it's like oh yeah that was like a funny little thing and you know capturing yeah. that but you know there's there's so many timely things as far as like people playing in certain bands at certain times and how that affects how they play in future bands and promoters yeah. and venues closing, you know, being able to still have videos from those. There's yeah. so many reasons, but yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, Taylor, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, what are your kind of tags? If anyone wants to keep up with you or your um, bands on social, my Instagram is some kind of ape with a space at the end. I think let me double check. Yeah, an, an underscore, I think. Yeah, 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 an underscore at the end. Some kind of ape, all one word. Um, you can follow me. I'm not that exciting to be followed, but that's 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 what I got on in Instagram. Yeah, I don't really post. Yeah, and then uh, DBK <laughs> promotions as yeah, well. Yeah, DBK. Oh yeah, DBK has no one's in charge of that, so I don't really. <laughs> I, I, I don't. Yeah, DBK promotion six oh four on Instagram. Uh, we just post shows. Sometimes we post videos from shows and on Facebook, we have DPK promotions. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, shout out to the BC hardcore scene. Um, I think this has been, uh, a great kind of, you know, way to kind of showcase, you know, the work that you've done and, you know, really, um, I have nothing but good things to say about, uh, what you're doing out there. So thanks man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the pod.